So yes, a product owner role. Um, so as you can see, I've got a few slides prepared, uh, but I'm more than happy to take questions um, you know, during the presentation. So if there's anything that you don't quite understand or you disagree with, um, or you know, if you'd like to comment, then uh, please make yourselves known. And we'll try and get a microphone to you. And uh, otherwise, you know, as we've just heard, there'll be a um, a Q and A uh, at the end. So I plan to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes. So that should leave us with hopefully enough time then to uh, answer additional questions. Cool. So um, the few things that I thought might be worthwhile to do with regard to the product owner role. Um, you know, initially, I'd like to sort of put it a little bit in context and um, position it in a way, say, you know, where does the product owner live? And then, uh, you know, there are a few aspects, um, you know, that I find uh, can cause recurring uh, issues if you if you don't, in a way, uh, get them right. One is, um, you know, if there's a product owner, then, you know, what is the assets, the entity, the product that the person should own? What, what is a product? Sounds trivial, but... Um, I've, I've, I, my experience suggests that answering that question effectively is is quite helpful. And then what about empowerment and authority? Um, how deep should the decision-making authority of the product owner go? A uh, little bit about value. Um, product owners are responsible for uh, creating value. And what does value mean? How can we define it? And what about scaling? Um, if, the, if there's a single product owner, then how can we scale up uh, the role? How can we... Uh, manage large and complex products. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Sounds good. Cool. Good. Yeah. So again, you know, if you've got any questions, uh, please don't don't uh, uh, you know don't be shy. Uh, shout out and interrupt me. So yes, product owner. Um, putting the role in context, uh, as briefly mentioned, that's the first thing I'd like to do. Um, so where does the where does the product owner live? Um, in order to answer that question, uh, I'd like to introduce a little Venn diagram uh, to you. And so the first uh, element, the first circle is called the users. So those are, those are the users, the customers, uh, the market, the beneficiaries of a, of a product. And then uh, the next one uh, covers the business. Those are the various business units of uh, a company, the company that provides the product. And then a technology uh, that stands for the development group and the development team or the development teams um, um, who uh, create uh, the, the product. And for me, the product owner lives uh, in the intersection of those three circles. So ideally, a product owner should be in touch with users, with end users on a regular basis. So the, the rule of thumb that I like to suggest is uh, meet uh, users at least selected users um, once a qu once per quarter, um, if you can, more frequently. And be in touch with the business and understand the business, just like a product owner should have a good understanding of the users and the user needs and be able to empathize with the users, have a good understanding of uh, the business or a good enough understanding of the business to be able to work with the, the partners, the stakeholders within the appropriate business units. And that might be marketing, sales, support, operations, finance, depending on the type of organization and product. And then uh, technology, uh, again, have at least enough interest and uh, basic understanding to be able to uh, communicate with a cross-functional development team. Um, and so, you know, this is also a variation of, um, um, uh, you know, a common definition of, of product management. And so for me, the, the product owner really is a product management role. Um, and, and not an IT role, uh, or not a not a development specific role, not a project management role, but somebody who, who looks and manages, uh, looks after and manages products. So, uh, a management role. Yeah. Um, and then, the product owner role, uh, as you're probably all aware of, uh, uh, comes from Scrum, emerged in Scrum, is defined in Scrum. And in Scrum, there's not only a, a product owner, uh, but there's also a, a development team. Uh, again, a multidisciplinary cross-functional development team. And uh, there's a Scrum master. And uh, all three roles should collaborate closely, uh, as I'm sure you've heard uh, many times before. But I think it's still important, despite all the close collaboration, to be clear on you know what are the core responsibilities and what kind of leadership uh, does a product owner or should a product owner exercise and compare that or contrast that with the development team and the Scrum Master. So that's uh, what I'd like to do here briefly. 
So for me, the product owner really has product leadership. And by that, I mean uh, the product owner uh, is responsible that there is a, a shared and meaningful, a, a compelling vision that aligns people, that describes the, the ultimate purpose for creating the product, the, the positive change it should bring about. Mm -hmm. So ideally, that you know provides a little bit of uh, inspiration to the people working on the product. Um, responsible for product strategy and roadmap. So um, essentially saying, what is our uh, approach to make the product successful or keep it successful? And how are we gonna implement this over say the next 12 months? What are some major milestones, some, some major goals, maybe bi-monthly or quarterly goals? And then uh, the product backlog prioritization, um, you know, making sure that there is a product backlog, making sure that it contains uh, helpful uh, items and determine the order in which those uh, items should be worked on and, and implemented. And then finally, stakeholder management, engaging with uh, key stakeholders, uh, people from the business, and drawing them in, making sure that they, for instance, participate in sprint review meetings, that they um, are involved in uh, creating, uh, reviewing, and updating the product strategy and the product roadmap um, to make sure that, uh, say, sales and marketing concerns are taken into account and a commercial product is indeed uh, marketable and, and sellable. So that's that's how I uh, see the product owner role, and you know what I would suggest are some some core responsibilities of the role. Whereas the development team for me has design and technology leadership. Um, so by that by that I mean that the the team is responsible for creating a product that has a um, an appropriate, uh, maybe uh, a pleasing, uh, a helpful, uh, a ben beneficial, uh, a nice user experience. Uh, so you know that the user interface design works, that the user interaction is appropriate, and so forth. Um, that uh, the right development techniques are applied, and that the right technologies are used. That the product is built in the right way, and the code quality is is right. That uh, the right architecture decisions are being made, and that the product is adequately uh, documented and thoroughly tested. And it's a self-organizing team in Scrum. Um, so that's, for me, another responsibility of the, the development team. And I've added this because I, I, I see it as a common mistake that product owners try and, in a way, uh, manage the development team and act, in a way, as a, uh, a team leader or project manager. But for me, that's a, a wrong understanding of the role. So product owner is not about team. Product owner is not about process. Product owner is not about project. Product owner is about, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> Product owner is about product. <clears throat> so what about the Scrum Master then? Well, I'd say the Scrum Master has process leadership. So responsible for uh, coaching, coaching with regards to process and methods. How can we do sprint planning? How can we do sprint reviews and so forth? Um, facilitates collaboration, helps people work together effectively, including uh, product owner and development team. So that those, in, those uh, individuals, uh, the right people talk to each other. Um, and facilitates organizational change. Um, so as you may have noticed, uh, establishing an agile way of working often does require an element of organizational development. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, th simple things such as reviewing job descriptions or um, uh, career ladders or employee selection criteria. But uh, with the product owner role, uh, you know, sometimes there's also some organizational change and development involved, particularly for organizations um, where traditionally, you know, the business uh, doesn't use any product management, such as retailers and banks, for instance, or media companies, where, again, you know, uh, typically uh, you, you wouldn't have any any product manager or product management group. At least you you, you didn't 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 used to have. Um, and so, if you if the product owner role, if product management is new to the organization, then establishing that role uh, may also need some some organizational change. And then uh, that's something that the Scrum Master should help facilitate. So again, uh, oh, there's one more missing, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, getting, rushing, rushing ahead. Uh, and then there are a few shared uh, responsibilities. So user research, uh, selecting a sprint goal and agreeing on it and refining the product backlog are in my mind, responsibilities that are shared between the product owner and the development team and, and truly fall under this idea of close collaboration and doing things together. So, you know, working on the product backlog should be a joint effort between the product owner and, and the development team. Yeah. And again, the, the intention here was not to, to confuse you with too much detail, 
but rather again sort of you know to tease out what are the core responsibilities and what kind of leadership do the different roles have and you know product owner is really about product not about project not about uh, exclusively product backlog um, not about looking after the team not about worrying about the development process those kind of things should be done by other people does that make sense so far are you, you still with me uh, a question yes please uh, what is the difference in functions uh, between the traditional product manager role and the product owner role? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'll give you I'll give you two answers if that's all right, uh, and I'll try to uh, you know. Uh, Keep it short and sweet, as short and sweet as I can. Uh, as, as you can tell, I like talking. So, <laughs> um, the first one is, the, is a sort of slightly theoretical answer. <clears throat> now, when when Scrum was created in the 1990s, and the the Scrum terminology was essentially formulated, uh, product management, um, I think, generally looked quite different from from what it looks like from what it is today. Um, you know, a product manager would typically carry out some market research, um, maybe uh, create a marketing requirement specification and, you know, think about, um, you know, what market market segment should the product address, what needs should be addressed, who are the competitors, what are market entry barriers, those kind of things. We'll also think maybe about um, uh, uh, economic fit and attractiveness and create a financial forecast, a business case. Um, a, a requirement specification, and then the requirement specification um, would be handed off to a project manager. And that project manager would uh, go and build the product according to that the specification with one or more teams. And the product manager would then only return to prepare the uh, introduction of that product or the release of that specific product version. So for launch or um, release. And there's this big gap in the middle where the the person, the product in charge, the, the person in charge of the product wouldn't be active, apart from occasionally uh, participating in a, a product steering committee or project steering committee, I should maybe say, and issuing some uh, um, control requests or some change requests. Um, <laughs> So the, 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 there's very, very limited collaboration, a very limited uh, um, work, joint work between the product manager and the development team or the development teams. And so that's, uh, in my mind, the primary reason why uh, Scrum's chosen a, a different name for, 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 for the role, for the product role in, in an agile context, in a Scrum based context. Because obviously the type of uh, interaction that we'd like to see between a product owner and the development team is very different from um, you know what you traditionally get between a product manager and uh, the development team, um, and, and obviously the process is completely different. It's no longer a waterfall process, but you know it's an, an, an iterative process based on uh, inspect and adapt or in, empirical evidence or build, measure, learn, whichever term you prefer. So. Um, I think that's just, for me. It's kind of useful to keep that in mind. That historic background. Um, and these days, often the the product manager and product owner role are used interchangeably. <coughs> in some frameworks, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the the product owner is is, is positioned as a, a tactical role, um, as, as a product backlog manager, and the product manager is uh, seen as a more strategic role. Um, uh, upholding the vision and making strategic decisions and looking after the product roadmap. Now that split in my mind, that understanding in my mind is wrong. Uh, I think it's really a, a, a misunderstanding of the product owner role and the intention behind the product owner role. Um, and so, um, you know, um, I, 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 I've started to use the term product people and product person just to get out of, you know, all those sometimes quite, quite, it seems, um, I don't know, emotionally charged uh, terms. <laughs> but I don't know if that's something you want to do. Was that a helpful answer? Yes. Uh, another one. Uh, uh, product backlog. Is the product owner responsible as well as accountable for it? Yeah, I'd say so. 
Um, the product owner is certainly responsible that a product backlog exists, that it is uh, stocked with meaningful items, and that it's adequately prioritized. And I should also say, uh, ultimately respond for, responsible for making sure that um, the high priority items are, are workable already. So they're small enough to fit into the next sprint, and you know they're they're clear enough, or there's a shared understanding be between the product owner and the development team, and that those items are testable. So you know the team can show that they've done a good work, uh, they know when they're done, and the product owner can co confidently uh, show or expose those uh, those pieces of functionality to uh, stakeholders and users. But again, the, the thing to be aware of, uh, and hence uh, you, um, uh, sprint goal selection and product backlog refinement here in this diagram is between the product owner and the development team. The thing to be aware of is that the whole product backlog uh, management piece should really be a collaborative. So it really should be truly shared work between the product owner and the team. I'd see the product owner in a leadership role, uh, leading and guiding the effort, but the, the team at being actively involved. And uh, I like to suggest that team members should uh, help uh, um, uh, tell stories and identify stories and capture stories and write stories. And some development teams are quite happy to, to take on some of the, the user story refinements on their own without the product owner having to be necessarily set next to them. But that's then entirely up to the, the relationship between uh, those two roles and you know what people are happy and comfortable with. Thank you. I had one more word that I've asked after myself. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Cool. So if there are no other questions, I'll, I'll continue. Um, so that was in a way just to, um, to get us started. <laughs> um, Right. The next thing I thought might be worthwhile exploring is uh, taking a, a little bit of a closer look at some of the uh, statements that you find in the Scrum Guide. And the Scrum Guide, as you may know, uh, captures the uh, the essence of uh, Scrum. Uh, and so what it says uh, is that the product owner is responsible for maximizing the value that the product creates. And so um, I find that many organizations seem to struggle to have a, a clear and shared understanding of, of what a product is. And um, I was uh, I was talking to uh, a client. I was in a in a session this this afternoon with a client where we talked about uh, how the product owner role was uh, is, is being applied in this specific organization. And you know, as it often is the case in my experience, we ended up talking about products and you know how they define products and how they define what a portfolio is and what is a product and what isn't a product. So if you want to understand the product owner role, I think you've got to start uh, by uh, looking at what are your products and how, how, what's your definition of a product. Um, and as I, as, I, as I briefly, very briefly mentioned earlier, it seems uh, that many organizations uh, are, are confused about what a product is and isn't. So I'll share you uh, my perspective and then um, maybe that's something that, that's helpful or, or maybe not, we'll see. Um, so do you own, if you work as a product owner, do you, do you own a product? Uh, that's the question here. Um, and so what is a product? Well, for me, it's pretty simple. Uh, a product must create value for users and it must create value for the business. Um, and uh, you know, value for users means uh, solving a problem, a specific problem, um, or at least uh, helping address it, helping solve it, or providing uh, as a, a benefit uh, uh, that's uh, significant enough for, for the users. So some of you may have used, uh, say, uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps to find the venue. Uh, well, uh, you know, that's a, a problem solving product. It uh, uh, you know, addresses the problem, how do you get from A to B? And that's the value it creates for you, I guess. Um, some of you may have used uh, Instagram or, or Facebook or Snapchat or, or WhatsApp earlier, or some of some of you may, may be using it right now, or maybe Twitter. Um, and, and those will be probably a benefit uh, generating products, products that uh, allow you to stay in touch with, say, family and friends in the case of uh, uh, Facebook, for instance. Yeah. And then, uh, in, in addition to that, uh, um, you know, every product uh, has to create a value, a tangible value for the business that could be generating revenue, as in the case of uh, the product that I'm using to show you these slides, uh, which is Microsoft PowerPoint, part of the Microsoft Office suite. So, uh, a, a, so it's a, a revenue generating product and an important cash cow for Microsoft. Um, or in the case of, uh, say, a Kindle app, uh, it will be a product uh, that generates revenue indirectly. Um, it entices us to uh, buy Kindle eBooks, 
and then uh, these uh, ebooks generate revenue for for Amazon. Um, but I mean, other products provide other business benefits. If you take the Google Chrome browser, for instance, then uh, there is no direct monetization or no indirect monetization that happens. But by using the Google Chrome browser and by then being immediately logged on and giving Google our data, um, you know, Google uh, knows what we're doing in detail um, and, and, and can harvest that data. Um, and um, and you know if the first thing that we do when we go online or certainly when we go on the internet is is use the Google browser then we're kind of tied in we're drawn into the Google ecosystem and we make a very close connection with the Google brand so there is a benefit not only from understanding user behavior and collecting relevant data and then doing possibly uh, whatever Google decides to do with it but but also in terms of brand awareness and uh, and, and brand equity um, you know, those, those are benefits that, that, in my mind, the Google Chrome browser offers. And then, you, you, you know, if you look at some, some uh, um, classic IT uh, uh, solutions, in-house build solutions, uh, you know, their, their goal is often to um, uh, automize, automate business processes or steps and, and reduce cost. So those are various ways how products can create value for the business. But I think, you know, if, if you if you currently manage an asset and you, you're not quite sure that you there's a clear cut user group and uh, or maybe there is one, but you're not 100 percent sure what the business benefits are. Or you find it really, really hard to articulate them. Then maybe maybe it's not a it's not a product. Maybe it's something else. It could be, for instance, a feature. So a feature would be a, a capability um, people interact uh, people interact with, but uh, something that doesn't create value for the business on its own. So if you look at a, a, a typical um, uh, online retailing uh, website, like, you know, if you go to say um, Tesco's.com or Sainsbury's.com or JohnLewis.com or, you know, whatever company your favorite online retailer is, then often you have a search and navigation function there. And you often have the ability to look at product details and, and look at reviews or maybe at some videos or you then have a checkout process with payment options but for me um, you know the the ability to choose different payment forms um, that wouldn't be a, a product in its own right necessarily but certainly from a user perspective i would regard it more like a feature a capability a step in a user journey rather than something that does a complete job for me I mean, when you when you order food or when you order products online, then typically what you want is you want to find the right food, the right products, and then decide to buy them. And then you know the, the value is actually created for you, or you know you know that the the, the ordering process was successful when you, when you receive the email confirmation. So you typically need a more complex interact interaction, and you topic, typically need several features to be present and work together to create that value both for the users. And I would also argue, say, for Sainsbury's and Tesco's. I mean, you know, if you go and uh, look up, I don't know, um, what could we look up? Um, um, uh, shampoos. Um, but then decide to buy it at the at a competitor. Then not much value has been created for uh, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, I guess. And then the third thing that people sometimes get confused about are, are components. Um, and so uh, if a component for me is an architecture building block, that doesn't necessarily have to be a component in the sense of, say, an enterprise Java bean. It could be a service or maybe a, you know, a microservice or a collection of microservices, so an element of the architecture. And um, I mean, I, I've worked uh, with, with an organization a while back where when I ran the first product product owner workshop, I, I expected um, that was a, a company at the south coast of the UK. I expected about five, six, seven people in the room based on the product portfolio that they had at this point in time. And when I turned up, there were over 20, 25 people. And so, um, you know, I, I was a little bit surprised and said, oh, thank you for your interest. It's great that you're all here, but this is a workshop for the product owners. And people looked at me, you know, smiled and nodded and said, yeah, yeah, we know, we know. And so I got even more confused and I said, but surely you can't be all product owners. And they said to me, oh, yes, we are, we are, we are. So how come there were so many product owners if the company only had five, six products or, or whatever? Well, most, most of those product owners turned out to be component owners as the introduction of Agile and Scrum had started in development. And every development team, uh, you know, each development team back then was typically a component team said, well, we're now a Scrum team, therefore we need a Scrum master and a product owner. 
And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the most experienced technical person, the technical lead became the product owner. Now, there's nothing, nothing what's wrong whatsoever to own a component or a feature. Those can be very interesting and very challenging jobs. And some components can be big. I mean, some components can, can grow into, say, a platform. And then managing a platform, uh, you know, can be, can be very exciting and very challenging. So this is not meant to be judgmental. However, <laughs> managing a product, I, I feel, uh, I think, is, is different from managing a feature and a component. It, it requires a different outlook and it has a different level of responsibility and it requires different skills. Or to put it round, if you own a component, you typically need decent technical knowledge. You need often in-depth uh, technical knowledge, whereas as a product owner, uh, that's not quite so so important. Uh, I think a technical uh, interest is important, but uh, otherwise a market understanding and an understanding of how the business works and how you can monetize your product and how uh, the, bu the, the business model works and which business models are available to you, I feel is is much more helpful. So it's just something for you maybe to to consider and for those of you who are product people to, to say, well, am I the product owner and am I owning the whole thing? So a you know, product owner is meant to own the, the entire offering. Do I own a part of a product and am I a feature owner? Uh, that's cool. But then, you know, that's what you're focused on. Your your job is then to, uh, in a way, um, make sure that that product works, sorry, that that feature works and that, you know, the feature works nicely, maybe in a, uh, in, a in a more complex user interaction. Um, or are you a component owner, uh, which again is cool. And as I said, you know, in some cases, quite a quite an interesting and uh, certainly an interesting and quite a challenging job. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, for me, this is not just a theoretical discussion. This is really about creating a shared understanding and then using the role in the right way. Because, you know, if you call your feature and component owners product owners, then, you know, people get confused. Um, and then, you know, people often say, well, we need we need other product roles. We need some product managers or we need some chief product owners or we need some Uber product owners or, or, or this or that. And it's like, no, you, you don't need any additional product roles. You just haven't applied the product owner role right. <laughs> That'd be probably my answer. Okay. Any any questions so far? Yes, we've got one memory. <laughs> Again, me back. Uh, you mentioned about product owner. You mentioned about product owner maximizing the value. How do you measure the value? Brilliant question. Thank you. Uh, it's one of the next things that I wanted to talk to you about. Ah, okay, so it's been covered. Okay, thank you. Okay. Got a question? Please, Mike. Mike. I just wanted to ask um, one of the challenges we have is the teams will often ask the product owner about the non-functional side of the product, so how performant it needs to be, how robust it needs to be, um, and often they struggle with this side of it. It's, it's very much like the features, the functions, and it's the last thing people think about. And I'm wondering, is it fair for development teams to expect the product owner to have this level of knowledge about their product? Or is it something that the team and the product owner should be exploring together? Yes, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. You know, I think a bit of both. Um, that'd be probably uh, my answer. So I do think it's important that product owners are aware that non-functional aspects, operational qualities, performance, robustness, interoperability, uh, certain security elements, usability uh, and other um, uh, similar qualities are important. They, uh, they, they influence uh, architecture and technology choices, they influence the user experience, they can even influence the uh, life expectancy of a product. Um, so, you know, I've seen products being built with uh, fairly uh, relaxed performance uh, requirements and then it turned on it and actually in order to uh, address a wider market, you know, much, uh, much more challenging uh, performance requirements have to be met, uh, you know, and that, that can have significant, as, as, as you may well know, a significant impact on the architecture and technology and in, in some cases requires a partial or even a complete rewrite um, of the, the product. So I think it's important to be aware of those, those qualities, but I think, you know, as you hinted at, I guess um, that's the way at least I understood you is, 
you know, it may not be entirely fair to expect that the product owner identifies in all those uh, um, uh, relevant qualities and is able to describe them precisely. I think that's really where the co collaboration piece comes in. Um, where the development team has to support the product owner and where the product owner also has to rely and be able to rely on the knowledge, uh, the expertise within that team. Um, and it goes back to, to sort of what we discussed earlier, that particularly the product backlog piece when it comes to the product owner work should be, should be collaborative. It should be a, 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 an area of ongoing teamwork where the team works with the product owner on a regular basis. Some teams like to do it on a daily basis. Some teams like to do it once every week. Uh, some teams do it once every sprint. There is no one right way. It very much depends on what works for the product and what works for the, the individuals involved. Thank you. We've got one more question? Is it? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, we're ready to move on. Cool, good, lovely. So uh, the next thing um, I, I wanted to uh, look at with you is uh, the question of how much do you own or maybe how much should a product owner own? <laughs> um, and uh, the, the model that I like to, to use is, is very, very simple. You can see it here. Um, so it's a, a version of the Onion model that I think originally Mike Cohen uh, introduced in his book, Agile Estimating and Planning, um, over 10 years ago. And, and so it, it talks about vision, strategy, and tactics. So vision is the overarching goal. Uh, briefly mentioned it before. Um, the overarching goal, goal, the reason why you want to build a product. Strategies than the path towards that vision. Uh, how are we going to attain the vision? How are we going to get closer to the vision? Um, and tactics are uh, the details, the steps that we have to take along the path, and the product backlog, and the user stories, and epics, um, sketches, user interaction diagrams, uh, story maps. In my mind, they belong to the tactical realm. Um, now, in terms of decision making, authority, and empowerment. <laughs> Um, a, a product owner in Scrum, certainly in Scrum, in my mind, should own vision, strategy, and tactics. Um, you know, it's it's very difficult to take uh, control of your product re responsible. It's very difficult to manage your product proactively. It's very hard to be responsible for the value that your product creates if you're not in charge, certainly, of the strategy in addition to the tactics. But what I find very commonly is that uh, product people are, are um, restricted to very much a tactical role. Um, and, uh, and, and then sometimes the strategic decisions aren't, uh, aren't made in a systematic manner or they're made by other people, uh, in some cases by, by management. Um, or if you develop a bespoke uh, product uh, for a, a specific client, then typically the client makes those uh, kind of big decisions. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's a wrong understanding, uh, I mentioned it earlier, you know, to portray the, the product owner certainly in Scrum as a, as a primarily tactical role. Um, Scrum is a development framework and it's extremely simple and it offers very little uh, specific guidance for product people. But only because the Scrum doesn't recognize a product strategy and a product roadmap and, and a business model, it doesn't mean that product owners shouldn't be familiar with those concepts and shouldn't be familiar with appropriate uh, tools and techniques in order to take advantage of them. Um, so again, I just you know I just felt in a way uh, compelled to, to 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 put this in and talk about it because again you know I've, I feel that so many companies struggle with this and uh, that there's a misunderstanding and sometimes that's part of a a wider organizational change process. If your business is going through a digital transformation, um, then and then as part of that, introducing uh, a product management, a product management group, then uh, you know it's only natural that uh, product owners, uh, maybe at present or, or in the past, uh, have been primarily focused on the tactics. It, it takes then time for the organization to understand and fully realize and empower those individuals. And, and it's not only an organizational aspect, it's also a knowledge aspect, right? So there's an organizational aspect, uh, trusting those people and uh, empowering those people. Um, but then there's also a, a knowledge aspect, uh, you know, ensuring that those individuals have the right, the right knowledge and the right skills and know uh, how to, say, create a, a, a valid or an effective product strategy and, you know, how to uh, draw up a product roadmap and how to uh, review and, and update it. 
And so if you currently find that you are uh, stuck more in a tactical product role and you'd like to become what's, what uh, a colleague of mine, Rich Mernoff, uh, uh, once referred to as a, a big product owner who's also responsible for vision and, and strategy, then, then often the easiest thing to do is, is to learn more about uh, strategy and, and, and vision and become more familiar with those concepts and um, experiment with appropriate techniques so you can provide some some guidance to management or you know um, that makes or you can make some suggestions and that makes it easier then for the decision makers in the organization to trust you and say like wow you, know, you seem to you seem to know quite a bit about how to do a product roadmap maybe maybe you should do this in the future wouldn't that be nice <laughs> Does that, does that make sense? Yeah? Yes, good. Um, cool. Good. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, yeah, product owner is responsible for maximizing the value of the product. So this is the value piece. Um, what is value and um, um, yeah, how can you maximize it? Maybe maybe, maybe let's focus on what, what is value. And um, there is no... Um, I think a generally accepted answer, how to determine value. My answer involves looking at a, a very simple structure uh, that is called the product vision board. Um, I'm a little bit biased here because I've, I've created this structure and so um, you know you may not necessarily agree with my definition of what value is or how to define value but um, you know, I found this structure quite helpful in order to figure out, you know, is it a product or not that we're talking about and you know what is the specific value it should create. So uh, as, as the name suggests, the product vision board captures the vision. So that's the product purpose, product's purpose or the, the positive change it should bring about. So if I wanted to uh, offer a mobile app that helps uh, people uh, understand um, if the food they consume is, uh, is, uh, is healthy for them, and maybe also uh, what the environmental impact is, um, then you know the vision behind such a product could be maybe healthy eating, be a healthy eating product. Um, so for me, that'd be kind of kind of nice vision. So I like to work with a vision that is that is short and sweet, that is big, um, and that has a, a horizon of sort of five years plus. So um, you know it doesn't change easily, and you can stay grounded in it even if everything else or many other things change. Yeah. Um, and then the, the sections underneath the vision is what I would refer to as key elements of a product strategy. Um, and so target group is about the market, market segment, the users and the customers. But maybe more interesting here for our discussion are the needs. And that's really the, the problem that the product solves or the benefit that it provides. And in terms of value creation, what I find helpful is to prioritize and focus on the most important problem, the primary problem or, or the primary benefit. Um, you know, sometimes products uh, address several benefits or, or several uh, um, uh, provide several benefits or address several pro problems. That's cool. But I think, you know, if, if, if the question is what value does our product create and does it create sufficient value and we'd like to measure that value, I think it's important to figure out, you know, what is what is the true value proposition and what's the reason for people to use this product or pay for this product? You know, why, why are people bothered? So that's that's the question that's behind this uh, this section here. Um, the next section, uh, again, maybe not quite so interesting for our discussion here, talks about what product is it, uh, what makes it special and stand out, what makes people uh, choose the specific product over competitor offerings. You know, why would they bother? Why am I using Microsoft PowerPoint and not Apple's key Keynote? Well, there's a simple answer to that. But uh, in terms of features, you know, it'd be, I don't know. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, PowerPoint uh, has a much better Apple Pen in in integration on an iPad on an iPad Pro, which may be surprising, but I think that's true. Um, so yeah, what are the standout features? What are the things that make your product um, different and give it the edge? Um, and then again, I think for the value discussion, very relevant, what are the business goals? So you know, how is the product going to benefit the company? I mentioned earlier generating revenue or helping market and sell another product, um, creating a brand awareness or, or enhancing brand awareness, increasing brand equity, reducing cost, um, providing the company with uh, important uh, technical knowledge. Uh, a, uh, um, a, uh, an example that comes to mind is the Toyota Prius. Um, so that product's been around for over 10 years, 
but when uh, Toyota first started shipping it, I think it was in 96, 97, uh, they lost money with every single uh, car that they sold. It was still beneficial for them. Of course, they're making decent money with the, uh, the, the automobile uh, now. But I think even back in the early days, it was beneficial for them because it, it, it changed the, the perception of the company. It made the car brand greener. And um, and it gave them uh, a, a massive uh, advantage or, or in in hybrid technology. So you know they they've become the, the world leaders in hybrid technology. And uh, and so some of the other established manufacturers uh, have, uh, have 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 partnered with 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 Toyota as far as I know. So um, acquiring a technological advantage and building up the relevant knowledge in my mind can also be a business goal if you're able to, to to quantify it and that's here the trick the trick with the needs and the business goal is, is to make them so specific that you can start measuring them and you can start figuring out if your product is actually meeting uh, those goals if your product is fulfilling the user goals and addressing the appropriate problem or generating the desired benefit and if your product is say um, meeting the revenue targets that you have or the brand equity targets or the cost reduction targets or whatever it may be. Now, this is a surprisingly simple, uh, I find this a very simple structure, but um, you know what's surprising about it is, is how hard it can be to answer those questions. And so I've met product people who, you know, were a little bit hesitant to uh, answer those questions for their products and struggled with some of those those questions. And so if you feel that might be the, the same uh, for you, then uh, maybe a useful exercise is to go away and uh, and um, and look at those questions in, in more detail and possibly even um, f answering those questions together with the development team and some of the key stakeholders. You can get people to write their answers on post-it notes and then put them on the wall and see how much agreement there is. Um, and if you have agreement, that's great. Then you have a shared uh, strategy in place. You also have a shared understanding of, you know, what your product does and why people um, interact with it, why people use it and why your company continues to invest in it. But if not, then there's an opportunity, I think, to uh, create that, this, this shared understanding. Oh, yeah. And uh, if, if you want to uh, download a, a PDF and if you want to download this the structure to print it out, then you can do this uh, from, from my website if you, if you choose to do so. But um, this is not about um, filling out a template or ticking some boxes or something. You know, this is really about answering questions so that the, the structure doesn't matter. The format doesn't matter. It's just about, I think, bringing awareness to, you know, what is the value and both in terms of user value, you know, the problem that my product solves and the, the benefit it creates and can I somehow measure this can i determine how much uh how much value the product should create for the users and how much the, the product is currently creating and the same then for the business goals you know you know what are the goals and how i'm going to measure if the product is meeting those goals or not so that was the, the value piece did that answer your, your question uh, uh, somewhat <laughs> a few questions on that so if i understand uh, correctly uh, you cannot basically assign a number to a value it is quite a collective thing again uh, depending on the organization and the product that we are working in uh, what i would like to know is uh, there are technical product backlog items as well how do you determine the value of the technical items because they are not bringing direct uh, tangible benefit to the business but they are intrinsically required Hmm? the product to succeed so yes that's correct how, how do you measure the value of that's correct um so the you know you you sort of didn't really uh, ask that question you made more a statement uh, i'd in a way like to challenge that again because i really feel that you may find it hard to quantify the value that your product creates for the users in terms of how well does it solve a specific problem or such as, you know, get me from A to B for a map based product like Google Maps or Apple Maps or, um, you know, help me stay in touch with family and friends, help me connect with f family and friends on a daily basis, such as Facebook. That may be hard maybe to to really uh, measure and put a numerical value on. I agree. But you can still use um, KPIs such as Net Promoter Score. 
uh, that, that allow you to do some quantitative analysis. You can still use KPI. So KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator. That's an, a metric that, that helps you determine how much value your product creates and how well your product is meeting its strategic goals. Uh, you can still measure retention, you can still measure engagement, you can still measure uh, sign-up rates. Um, and then you have the corresponding business goals, say a revenue generation um, or, um, um, you know, profits, uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's a more established product um, or, or cost, you know, so you have, you have your financial KPIs that you can measure and, and you can do some, some, some quantitative analysis on. So I'd really encourage you to, to be as specific as you can when it comes to value and, and split that value into needs, user needs, user customer needs and, and business goals and, and really try and, 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 and set targets so you can measure the progress, progress towards these targets. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing about the product backlog, um, let me just quickly see if I can jump here. Um, so uh, this is my uh, backup slide. So the, the, the model that I like to use, and that's just the way I like to play it, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right for you, but um, you know, by showing you this model, I feel that's the best way to answer your question. So I like to start with a vision. And based on the vision, I like to create a product strategy. And that, again, you know, that's really um, the overall approach, the path towards the goal, the goal being the vision. And so the strategy should really answer, you know, what is our plan, our general plan to achieve success, to make that product successful, therefore to create enough value for the users and for the business? You know, what is it? And then uh, from, from based on that uh, product strategy uh, that talks about value proposition and market and differentiators and so forth and business goals, I like to derive an actionable product roadmap. And that product roadmap then says, you know, what is the journey you want to take your product on? And how do you intend to implement the product strategy over the coming, say, 12 months? And, and I, I like to work with um, midterm goals, bi-monthly, quarterly goals on the product roadmap. And again, those goals are derived from the needs and the business goals in the strategy. And based on the next goal, you know, I, I derive the backlog contents from. You know, so I, I, I use what was once called in Scrum release goals and stick them on the product roadmap or identify them on the product roadmap and use them to then uh, um, uh, stock the product backlog. So that way I make sure that everything that's in the product backlog is valuable because the product backlog is linked to the product roadmap. The roadmap is linked to the product strategy and the strategy is linked to the vision. But personally, I don't try to ensure that every single product backlog item is, is valuable. I think that's very, very hard. Um, you know, it tends to be the case, it tends to be possible for end user functionality, um, particularly for mature products where you have the option to implement feature A or implement feature B. And you can do a cost benefit analysis for feature A and you can do a cost benefit analysis for feature B, or you can do a cost of delay analysis for, for, for one of those, for, for both features. And then you say, okay, you know, you know, where do I where do I get more for my money? You know, if, I, if we go for feature A or feature B, okay, let's go for feature B. But for young products uh, where the features are still developing and you may not even be quite sure if you need those features or to which extent you need them. Very, very difficult at an early stage of, you know, say a, a three to six month cycle to determine the value of each uh, feature or even each item in the product backlog. So that is not a, a scrum requirement. And I honestly don't know who came up with this idea. Personally, I feel it's a little bit misconceived, I have to say. Uh, maybe that's strong. Maybe you disagree. That's perfectly OK. But I wouldn't put myself under pressure saying every single item in my product backlog must be valuable. It's like, well, it must be helpful and meaningful in terms of helping me achieve, say, the goal to increase engagement or the goal to uh, improve the user experience and reduce uh, um, churn and increase retention. Yeah, in that sense, it has to be helpful and beneficial, but valuable that I can quantify it and you know put a sterling number or a euro uh, number, pound, euro or whatever dollar number, whatever currency it is on it. I don't know. No, I don't think so. Thank you. That was helpful. Good. I just Sorry, a quick question about the product backlog. Um, sure. Who should who's responsible for writing the user stories? Is is that a collaboration 
um, between the product owner and the development team, or should the product owner write all the user stories? Yeah, for me, it's a collaborative piece. For me, really, it's a, it's a collaborative piece. I mean, I, I really quite like to involve the, the development team, or at least individual development team members in visioning, strategizing um, discussions. And I also like to involve at least selected development team members in, in terms of representatives, who, of course, are chosen by the development team in, in product roadmapping activities. But the product backlog in terms of stocking a product backlog, in terms of prioritizing it, in terms of then updating it, refining it, uh, working new insights into the backlog, I think that should be a collaborative effort. There are a number of reasons why. Well, the first one is in order to prioritize the product backlog, you typically have to take into account technical risk. Uh, product owners aren't always aware of the technical risks that are contained in the, in the product backlog. Um, so they, they often need development to help them. Um, you know, as human beings, we tend to be, you know, we, we tend to be, uh, we tend to favor our own ideas. And it's happened to me more than once. Uh, maybe, maybe you're different, but certainly to me, it's happened more than once that I've subconscious, sub subconsciously, unknowingly, I know, filtered out information. I wasn't aware of that, but I filtered out information because it, it didn't correspond to what I thought was right. And it didn't correspond to my ideas. And so if you now uh, say, look at user data, look at user feedback or stakeholder feedback collaboratively, then this idea of, um, you know, that you prefer ideas that, that confirm your, your preconceived notions, uh, you know, which is called conf confirmation bias, that, that risk is, is significantly reduced. And also, you know, I find that some product owners, um, <coughs> You know, struggle. They struggle with the workload, and they struggle with the, the amount of questions they get in the sprint. And and often that's an indication that there's not enough product backlog uh, collaboration happening. Because if you invest in working with the team, then yeah, that can be it can be can be strenuous, and it can be initially more work for you. But as you continue this process, the team will build up more and more knowledge about the product and the domain. And by, by doing so, it'll be able to um, answer certain questions. You know, people will be able to answer questions, certain questions at least on their own, or they can do some of the refinement on their own. So actually, in the, in the long term, it reduces the workload for product owners. So the number of reasons why I think it's, it's really, really healthy and beneficial, and hence Scrum recommends that you, know, you should really, uh, the team, the development team should budget for joint uh, product backlog activities in the sprint planning meeting and set aside uh, some time. Yes. Thank you. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll continue and talk a little bit about um, the, um, oh, I see I've nearly spoken for uh, 55 minutes. So I'll, I'll try and talk uh, quite quite quickly about scaling. So the idea being that, you know, <laughs> product owner is seen as a, as a single person, product owner should be a single person, not a committee. You've probably heard this or read this uh, statement before. So how can you scale? Well, um, my suggestion is to use a, a, a model that I find very beneficial for product people, the product lifecycle, to decide if and when you should scale. So um, the, the curve that you see is sort of a, um, a, a common uh, curve, a common trajectory when you track the business benefits, the benefits that your product generates for the business over time. And up to launch, up to the release of the initial uh, product version, uh, no business benefits are being uh, uh, generated. So the trajectory is flat and then it rises slowly until you've achieved what is referred to as product market fit. So uh, you now have a product that fits the mainstream market, a larger market. And if it's a revenue generating product, you start to earn money at this stage. So uh, in terms of you see the products becoming profitable around that, 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 that sort of uh, point in time. Um, the phase between launch and product market fit is traditionally referred to as introduction. And then after product market fit, uh, people talk about growth. Um, now, uh, oh yeah, and eventually everything that is born must die. Um, that, that's also true for products. So there's at some point in time, the, there's a, uh, the product is no longer available and you discontinue it. Um, now, for as long as you have a brand new uh, pro product in terms of the product is, is in development, being developed, the initial version, or it's very young, you've just launched it, um, I would suggest that you try and uh, cope with a single product owner, a single product person, and also a small amount of development teams, maybe one or two. Uh, the reason is that the smaller you are, the faster you can move. And um, assuming that you have the right people with the right uh, 
um, uh, qualifications on board, that makes it much easier to respond to feedback and, and changes. Um, also, at this stage, your strategy tends to be very volatile. And so it's very helpful to have a strategy, strategic and tactical decisions um, in a way uh, unified in one person and not distributed across uh, multiple people. But of course, once your product has uh, achieved product market fit or is about to achieve product market fit and you have to add more features and then as your product starts growing and again, it's, you know, typically means more and more functionality, more and more features are added to address an, uh, uh, an increasing amount of uh, users. You somehow have to think about sharing ownership and involving more product people. So there are three techniques I'd like to uh, briefly introduce to you. Uh, the first scaling option would be to have a product owner and then feature <coughs> component owners. So, you know, similar to what we discussed earlier, feature owners would own a feature a capability users can interact with. Um, and a component owner would be an architecture building block. Now, the product owner here in this model is responsible for strategy, roadmap, financial forecast, backlog management, metrics, KPIs, stakeholder management. And the feature owners, component owners are more specialized. So they, they really uh, describe their features and they make sure that their features work and, um, excuse me, that they test out ideas for how to in, uh, in, um, advance and optimize uh, their, their features. And they work with the development teams. Yeah. So while the product owner, the overall product owner is still in charge of the product and the overall product backlog, you know, the individual is a, in a way a step removed from the actual development work and the development teams. Um, I think that's just a, a, a consequence of a scaling. As you scale, the product roles simply become more specialized. So that's option one. And by the way, the feature owners here, uh, they're similar to the uh, um, product area owners in the scaling uh, framework less. So um, if you're familiar with less, then uh, replace a feature owners with a product area owners. Uh, scaling option two is not to um, split uh, the product, uh, or the product owner role, but split the product. So uh, we've got product A and we uh, either break out a feature, uh, we break a feature out of product A and unbundle this feature into a separate new product, product B, um, or we create a variant. And therefore we have a product owner A and a product owner B now. So uh, an example, an unbundling example would be uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, some of you may still be emotionally scarred from when a few years ago, Facebook decided to uh, um, uh, spin off uh, the Messenger feature into an app, into its own app. Um, so that would be a classic example of unbundling. It simplified the user experience, but it's also helped um, Facebook experiment with the newly created product. And uh, you can do all sorts of things with Messenger these days, including um, performing financial transactions, as, as far as I know. Yeah. So uh, and that's for me a, quite a quite an interesting option and an option that's worthwhile thinking about for those of you who have products that are rather large and have become somewhat heterogeneous. So you've got quite a mixture of different features, and maybe not all of your users always use all the features. Then unbundling this product um, can be quite an attractive option. And then the, the last option is what you find in, in SAFE, in the scaling framework SAFE as a default. You have a strategic product role and a tactical product role. Um, so strategic role uh, looks after vision, strategy, roadmap, uh, all the, well, strategic stuff. <laughs> and the tactical role, uh, you know, that's sort of a you know, glorified uh, product backlog manager, really. Uh, well, looks after the product backlog, user stories, and so forth. Um, now, in SAFE, the strategic role is called product manager. And the tactical role is called product owner. But as I've said earlier, for me, that's a, 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 an unfortunate <laughs> a, a misunderstanding of the, the product owner role. So, you know, that's a legitimate and in some cases, you know, very uh, valid, and very useful scaling option. But if you go for it, then I would suggest that you refrain from calling the tactical product uh, role uh, product owner because the product owner is not meant to be, it's not meant to be a tactical role. Um, yes. Um, and so when uh, could you use which scaling option? A single product owner, uh, as I said early on, before product market fit, and then when your product grows, product features, uh, product and uh, feature owners, maybe component owners, and also variants and unbundling, and strategic and tactical roles. Personally, I would recommend uh, using 
when your product has become mature and is uh, rather stable. So if there's only uh, limited changes, particularly at the strategic level, because you know the, the, the challenge when you split strategy and tactics is that you, you still have to ensure that the strategic and the tactical decisions are closely aligned and any insights from the tactical uh, realm um, are passed on uh, to the strategic one and influence strategic decisions. And again, uh, you know, that's kind of difficult if you have specialists, one person who takes care of the strategy, another person who takes care of the tactics. <coughs> so that's it, really. Uh, there's not much more for me to say. Um, Ro, can I ask a question about... Sure, of course, sorry. Scaling options. Um, so you mentioned Facebook and you mentioned Messenger. Um, what might you imagine Facebook have done in terms of scaling options for Messenger? Like, will they have one product owner or will they have lots of product owners? Yeah, great question. Thank you. So, you know, it's... I don't know. So, you know, I, I don't know how Facebook works and I, I don't know, I, I, at least I don't know any details and certainly not with regards to, to messengers. I have to speculate here, but, you know, if, if I wanted to spin off, if I wanted to unbundle a, a feature, then I would try and start small. I mean, if you unbundle uh, a feature, in a way, it's new product development uh, that you carry out. Yes, the feature's been around. Yes, you've got data about how users use that feature, but you now still need to launch it as a product in its own right. So there's an element of new product development in there, I feel. And whenever you build something new, it's kind of kind of useful to uh, you know be small and be, be fast and be truly agile. Um, um, so, you know, I would try and work with one product owner and maybe one or two development teams, unless that's impossible, unless, you know, it's, uh, it just requires so much effort that you have to start with more teams. Um, and, and then you often need more, more product people and you then have to think about some form of, of hierarchy or collaboration. For instance, working with feature owners and one over, overall product owner. Great, thank you. So uh, those are just some uh, wise words at the end. Uh, they're probably not very, very wise. Um, uh, just to make you aware of that, I, I don't think there's one right way to apply the product owner role. So you really have to look at your product. You really have to look at where it is in its in its life cycle, how much you how stable it is, how much risk and uncertainty, how much complexity is present. Um, and uh, you know, as, as briefly mentioned, I, I do think that the product owner role is best understood as a as a product management uh, role. And uh, that being an effective product owner does mean that you require product management skills. Again, only because Scrum doesn't recognize a uh, product strategy or product roadmap or a business model as uh, formal artifacts, it doesn't mean that these things aren't tremendously useful for you. They, they really are. Um, and finally, uh, you know, let's, I, I feel we, we shouldn't worry too much about, you know, product manager, product owner, product this, product that. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it shouldn't be about the, the, the job roles and titles. It should really be about the value that we create, that the benefits that we, um, that we create through our products for the users, for the user community and for our own business. So uh, that's it really. So uh, you can find more information um, about the product owner role. Um, on my website, um, I've, I've written quite a few uh, articles, blog posts um, on, on on the role. Uh, so maybe maybe you want to check it out. Oh yeah, um, books. Uh, this is uh, this is just a little ad for uh, um, my, my two books. Um, uh, one of which uh, I heard is uh, going to be given away later on. So uh, maybe maybe something for you to consider to see if there's anything useful in there. And then uh, I'd love to hear more questions uh, from you, but I do realize that maybe not everybody's comfortable uh, asking a question in a larger group, or maybe not all of you get to uh, ask your question. Um, and at some point in time, Peter will be arriving if it hasn't arrived. So if, please feel free to reach out to me via email or uh, Twitter or other social media channels if you uh, have any follow-up questions. So thank you. So um, thank you very much, Raymond. Um, I'm aware that we could keep talking for the next couple of hours. It's been really, really good. Um, there are people who still want to ask questions, but I'm going to be respectful of your time. Um, so we're going to we're going to close there. But thanks again for for your generosity with your time, and uh, and it's worked really well from our point of view. This this uh, remote event, um, and maybe we could get in touch about um, a follow up talk in 2019.
Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I'm, I'm happy, by the way, to, to take a few more questions uh, if, if, it's, if that's okay for you guys. I mean, I don't, don't want to sort of keep you away from the pizza. I can't. <laughs> pizza. Thank so you. I'm going to have the microphone over to Imran. <laughs> Back at eight. Uh, some organizations have a role of business analyst in the team. How, I mean, what is the relation between how typical or, or should, how should I put it? Uh, what are the functional differences between a product owner role and a business analyst role? Yeah, nice question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, it's a question that I think you, you, to a certain extent, have to answer yourself. As I know, there is um, there is now a, a framework that sort of defines business analysis activities. But I do find in practice that it, the, the business analyst role varies greatly. So I've seen business analysts who basically act as as product people. But I've also seen business analysts being uh, much more technical and more, you know, system architects. And uh, so if you if you work as a business analyst and you um, you do interact with the users and you uh, you you talk to users, you observe users, you you you're quite familiar with the problems that they that, that you know that they have. If you know how the, the users use your pro product and if you uh, make uh, key product decisions and help describe the requirements and capture user stories, then I think you know the role that you're playing is quite similar to a product owner. Um, you know, you may want to go back to one of the the early slides that talked about sort of the, the the leadership of the three roles in Scrum, and I sort of said you know product owners, product leadership. So it's about vision, it's about strategy, it's about roadmap, it's about stakeholder management, it's about product backlog prioritization. That's really where the focus should be in my mind, rather than you know, necessarily purely refining user stories and writing acceptance criteria. And so depending on where your focus is currently, you know, there, there'll be a, a gap or, or, or not quite such a big, big gap. Um, and you can use that then to determine, um, you know, what, it's, what it would take to move into a product owner role in which uh, knowledge and skills you may have to, to acquire. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Roman. Hello, Roman. Um, my question is going back to one that you answered earlier um, to get a bit more information. So it was when we were talking about the tactical product role as opposed to the scrub product owner role. Um, if you have kind of put forward strategies and visions to your senior leadership, but they're, they've already got a strategy in place, they're not kind of um, willing or able to consider yours, how would you then go about breaking out of that tactical role? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, sharing it. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a difficult one for me to answer. Um, so, you know, I'm my 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 honest opinion is that it be very it'll be it, it it will be very hard for you. It will be challenging for you to do a good job as the product owner if you don't own the strategy. And so if somebody asks you to look after a product but says, hey, 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 okay, you know, in terms of, you know, market and value proposition and standout features and maybe also, you know, major goals, milestones over the next 12 months, it's all sorted. You know, just, just follow those plans. We've worked it out. Trust us. Or just, you know, do as you're told. Then, you know, why do people hire, hire you as a product owner? Um, because, you know, they're not putting you in the position so that you can really um, – uh, you know, fulfill all the, the necessary responsibilities. If if you're quite happy, however, to play a tactical role, then, um, you know, by all means, and if that's, that's useful and helpful, by all means, go ahead and do it. Um, just make sure that you, um, you you understand the the product strategy and roadmap and that there is a documented and, and agreed upon, understood uh, strategy and roadmap and make sure you know that you know who to align with in order to uh, discuss changes. This very simple example, say, you know, you you uh, show or release an early product increment to selected users, and the feedback you, you get suggests that um, one or two key features in the product backlog are not appropriate. Well, that may well endanger, you know, the, the, the current goal that, that, that you're working towards, which may then trigger a change in the roadmap 
or maybe even simpler, um, you know, the development uh, progress is not as uh, fast as you anticipated. Well, you know, if, if it just turns out that the progress is slow, then again, you may well have to adjust the, um, the, the product roadmap. And so if you don't own the roadmap, who do you need to talk to in order to get this plan adjusted and updated? Thank you very much. I think a lot of product owners would like to play that clip from your answer to their senior leadership. <laughs> Any final question? One over there? Uh, <laughs> So I think we've gone through quite a bit, you know, how to scale up and what happens when you've got a bigger, bigger product. Um, one of the situations I find I see a lot is when the sort of the responsibility for what you'd consider as a product owner role is sort of spread between two different organisations. So typically you've got um, a group of people that are sort of creating the product, and you've got a customer who's you know wants a problem solving, but they've not necessarily got any. Um, skip, so they've not necessarily got these skills or experience to take on those sort of full product owner responsibilities, even though they have set the vision and perhaps the strategy, but they certainly don't have um, any of those sort of skills for the layers in middle. How would you go about splitting a product manager, product owner role if it's not practical for one person to have it? So sorry, can I just ask, uh, that was for a bespoke product you know, that you de de develop for a specific client? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. So I, I do think that there are two options. One option is that the client does take on the product owner role, um, something that I do for uh, the, the, the website of my business. Um, you know, the, the, the development team is part of an, an agency based in, uh, in Brighton. It's something I've done for many years and I, I very much enjoy. But, you know, as you hinted at, it does mean that the uh, client finds somebody suitable who has appropriate knowledge and can free up time and is respected enough in her or his organization. Um, the alternative is that the the uh, agency, the, the, the solution provider, uh, uh, offers that role. But, you know, the, the thing to watch out for is that then, at least in theory, the agency product owner would make all the product decisions and the client would only be in an advisory uh, role. So, you know, still participating in sprint review meetings, providing feedback, but that feedback may or may not be actioned. That would be decided by the agency product owner. Now, I don't know how many clients are, are happy with this solution. Maybe some are, maybe, maybe, but I guess many, many others are not. And so I do think there's an opportunity for uh, agencies to offer some product owner coaching or some product owner training. Um, but what I would certainly recommend is that in addition to, say, agreeing on specific features or specification, that you do go back to, you know, the question of what is your, you know, what is what is the reason behind the product? What is the motivation and what is the value the product should create? Um, and, and you essentially say, OK, you know, who should be the users? And are you sure about this? Um, are you sure about the, the problem that the product should address and how will the product benefit you as a business and how will the product be different from existing solutions, existing uh, products? I think those are questions to answer with a client and I know at least of one agency um, um, where people use the, the, the product vision board that I've shown you earlier uh, in order to, as part of the, the, the acquisition process and you know, as part of uh, the process of essentially getting to, uh, to a deal with clients. I don't know if that was helpful. Oh, sorry, got about that. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Roman. Um, can we just show appreciation for Roman and his time? Yeah, thanks, guys. It was it was nice to be with you. Thank you for 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 your interest, listening to me. Thank you for sharing your your questions, and um, yeah, I, I do hope you uh, you'll enjoy the pizza and uh, yeah, have a good rest of the evening. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye.